Dede Wababaji Dogun, our old channel service data and information analyst, joins us this morning. Thank you for coming on today. Let's look at a number of things, uh, maybe two, three. Well, the president did talk about the fact that they like to introduce, well, maybe not him directly, but uh, of course, he was reported why did that, who knows. We may have this war against and discipline back in the country to uh, maybe the way it turned out the last time out. But if that were the case, uh, you might have looked at some figures. Do you think it will have the perhaps required impact this time? It, it all depends on how it will be carried out this time. Um, when it was launched in, on May 20, 19, 1984, the major challenge war against indiscipline had is how do you measure indiscipline? Unlike corruption, that we have um, a global body, Transparency, Transparency International, that ranks corruption, and you can easily measure corruption based on indices like more people giving or taking bribes. Um, and because we can measure corruption, on that list we have ranked 136. And clearly, we then can easily ask ourselves how do we get to replace Denmark, which is the least corrupt country in the world? Because we can measure corruption, we can more easily manage it. So if we're going to be launching whatever version of the war against indiscipline, if we can't measure indiscipline, then there's no way we're going to really be able to manage it. And that's exactly why war against indiscipline had failed. Now, even looking at some of the reports and futures that came out then, we could yeah. clearly see... Um, there was so much um, noise on even indiscipline among the police. So that had come up a lot um, on a lot of reviews. But this time around, if we want to kick off the war against indiscipline, then we need to ask ourselves, how will we know if this war is successful? Exactly. So we had had a lot of indiscipline issues in the public service, especially within the police force. So this time around, unless the first step should be we coming up with an indicator of things that we want to measure on that indiscipline parameter, and it is extremely difficult. So how do you want to measure indiscipline? That is what we need to ask and answer first before we start the war. The second thing is a war against in discipline is actually a corrective measure. The second side is what we haven't started, and that is the love for discipline. So why against indiscipline attempts to correct indiscipline. But what we should also start doing, which is good, so why against indiscipline, if well managed, by defining how we want to set the parameters to know if it's been successful, really does um, make a lot of sense. The second so, is now we kicking off a love for discipline. So what if you, if that comes in, and then you see the way a manner with which people perhaps conduct themselves on the drive, uh, attitude on the street, queuing up to do things in an orderly manner, wouldn't all of those be indicators as to how successful or otherwise the policy is? Exactly. Now those can be indicators, but those indicators have to be clearly defined so that the government can easily bring out global or national reports to easily measure its performance of indiscipline. Because if those performances on indiscipline are not measured, the government itself will not be able to know if it's been successful in its war against indiscipline. And it also then needs to launch the second one, which is more preventive. So war against indiscipline is corrective. Love for discipline is preventive. So those two um, projects really would um, help, help change the the attitude and culture. But, but clearly we can measure the fiscal discipline. No, we, we can. <laughs> the question I was going to ask you is, would this war against indiscipline and love for discipline help in any way to curb the excesses that politicians and public servants take on themselves? Um, yes, it will, because if we do it well, the same way that global body, Transparency International, has taken on the role of measuring corruption and really ranking all all countries based on corruption parameters. If we're able to successfully hold on to indiscipline, perhaps we also can be known as that reference point when it comes to discipline and not just indiscipline in the world. And clearly one of the reasons why we also now even need to also even look at issues of discipline is looking at 
our performance even during the Olympics. Okay, it's all it's been largely attributed to indiscipline. You look at um, in performance on whose part? Performance on the part of those managing the athletes. It's been a lot of indiscipline. We have we have a lot of figures flying about of up to 2.5 billion naira that potentially was released for the Olympics, and we only came back with just one medal. But what medal doesn't even show our story of indiscipline at the Olympics? Our indiscipline starts from looking at the history of the first medal we won in Tokyo, 1964. In 1964, you had Cuba as well, won only one medal, just like us. Rio 2016, Cuba won 11 medals. Kenya too, right? Kenya as well. Kenya won only one medal in 1964, when we also won one. This time around, Kenya has won 13 medals. The if you look, and, and then our, our, we've, we've shown a lot of indiscipline over the years. And we won just one. Just one. And Kenya has won Kenya 13. has won 13. In 1964, when Nigeria and Kenya had only one medal, we should have found a way to be more disciplined and aim to improve our performance. Now, if you look at the 16 Olympics that we've been to, 10 out of the 16 Olympics, we've either had zero medals or only one medal. <laughs> Obaji, the athletes, the Nigerian athletes, work every day. You just need to go to the stadium or around the stadium, Lagos, anywhere there's a stadium, to see them training every day. So, if where, where are we missing it? Where are we indisciplined? And how is it that we consist consistently stay at this one spot? Okay, so indiscipline is how do you train the athletes? It's not about just working hard. How do you train the, train athletes? the athletes? So the athletes... It's not a question of the athletes training themselves. No, it's not the athletes training themselves because it's not just about hard work. It's about smart work. The athlete can be on the, on the journey of hard work. The team that is managing him should be on the journey of smart work. When smart work meets hard work, we get medals. But when it's only hard work from the athletes and the leaders and managers are not involved <coughs> with the smart work, then we, we have lots of poor, poor results. And that's what's happened really during, during the Olympics. A what, lot what of hard work leads to smart work. Would it suffice if they say, look, we don't have a lot of money this time, so perhaps could that explain away the reason why the performance is poor? Nigeria's economy is bigger than the economy of Kenya. Here's what it means. It means we have more money than Kenya, but we have less medals than Kenya, even though our population is significantly higher than Kenya's. So we have no excuses. We have absolutely no excuses. Let's then move on to the public servants, the states remuneration that they get. I know we've looked at those of uh, the um, <coughs> legislature. Do we have anything for the states? The states, theirs is even more interesting. What you have the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission say is the monthly salary of a state governor is 648,000 naira. They say the monthly salary of a deputy governor is 616,000 naira. Now, here's why it, all of this is important. A group called EFINA, and I often refer to them because the Bill and Melinda Gates have interest in them. They say only 2% of Nigerians earn above 100,000 naira. So what does all of this mean? It simply means what the state governor earns is much more than what 98% of the people pay him for. So you have the state governor being paid from the purse of taxpayers' purse. However, 98% of the taxpayers that contribute to what the state governors earn do not earn anywhere near what the, the state governor or the top executives and so it clearly shows there's a lot of this 
con um, connect between that. And clearly, when a civil servant isn't paid, and understanding how much are being paid, um, how much the state governor collects, not just in terms of salary, in terms of all the travel allowances, in terms of okay. all the security votes, all then right. that's what often causes the problem. Those figures that the state governors have, does it matter when they then say, look, we, we need to uh, see how we could, in fact, they say they reduce salaries, their own salaries. Would that have an impact on the scheme of things? Re reducing their salaries wouldn't have significant impact because where the state governors and top level executives make a lot of money is not from their salaries, it's from security wide votes and allowances. Let's get Mark Wayne. Mark Wayne. Yeah, sir, I was going to ask you this uh, salary you just talked about is stipulated or recommended or, you know, it's a unified thing by an institution I like to call RAMFAC. Would you recommend, you know, that each state be able to determine what it is that it wants to pay its governor? I think if each state um, is allowed to pay, um, to, record, to decide on how much um, it would pay, pay governors or deputy governors, I think those figures will be significantly higher. Because RAMFAC at the moment only determines mm. the annual salary and the severance gratuities. Allowances are completely at the discretion of the states, as well as so many undocumented freebies that the state governors collect. Now, allowing the states to now clearly choose to pay its governors or deputy governors will probably lead to greater agitation. Because already, there are signs of great agitations. Go ahead, Marque. Now the reason I ask this is because you know people say that you know some states say we are poor state and some say we cannot afford minimum wage and some people say we can afford a lot more. Shouldn't each state be able to determine what it is they can afford to pay its governor the same way they are agitating to be able to pay their workers what they can afford to pay them? It's, it's interesting. Um, today what we have is we have a lot of agitation on state governors or state government saying they cannot pay the minimum wage. However, there's no agitation from any state saying it cannot pay a state governor. Don't you find that surprising? Till today, there's no agitation within any states that RAMFAC, the amount that you've asked us to pay the state governors, we cannot afford it. <laughs> However, the that, challenge that, is... That. That will be interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid we need to add at that point. But Baji Deo Gusa was channel to this data and information analyst. Thank you very much indeed for coming on again today. Well, that's the show today. We thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week. I'm Chamberlain Usa. I'm Nail Tai. We enjoy your weekend. I wonder what the reaction to that will be. That will be the day. Thank you. I'm Mao Ogu.